It's not necessarily anything new, but I think we all recognize that we live in a day characterized by conflict and disagreement. Like I said, it's not like it's never happened before, but how to vote, how to parent, how to respond in a pandemic, yeah, we can get pretty worked up about how we feel about certain issues. Well, for the next two Discover the Word podcasts, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture together that gives evidence to the fact that in the early church, followers of Christ struggled with conflict as well, taking different positions on how to express and live out their belief in Jesus. The Apostle Paul wrote letters to several of those churches, and one of his recurring themes was unity. In fact, in his letter to the church in Ephesus, he offered a summary list of what we as believers hold in common together and where we need to be standing as one. But he also made it a point to say that when we invest our many unique, multifaceted, and diverse gifts in the communal body, well, that's when we move toward maturity in Christ. There's a one aspect and a many aspect, unity in our diversity. And so how do we balance that? That's what we're going to be talking about as we study Ephesians chapter 4 together here on Discover the Word. Welcome to the start of another series of Bible study conversations on Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. Around the table for this are Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. And it's Elisa who will be guiding us through this study. She's called One and Many, in which we'll be focusing on Ephesians chapter 4 and how our faith and our churches might be stronger if we followed Paul's advice today about unity and diversity. Glad you're part of the group for what I'm sure will prove to be a challenging study. Because as I said, it isn't new, but it is real for us today. This environment in which so many areas of life are marked by conflict and disagreement, where diversity is making unity difficult. And we need the concept of e pluribus unum. On the great seal of the United States, as well as on several of our coins, there is a slogan. Do you know what it is? E pluribus unum. Yeah. And what in the world is that? Out of many, one. There are 13 letters in the Latin, E pluribus unum, to represent the 13 colonies that made one country. And what's the significance? I mean, you said the 13 colonies, but why was that such a big deal? Well, gosh, they're coming out of just so much turmoil and pressure from England. If they were ever an opportunity to become more divisive or more frustrated with each other, it would probably be in a situation like that. And so it's kind of a powerful challenge as well as an invitation, I think, mm. to create something new out of something that was pretty stressful. I also think about the reality that we're always a nation of immigrants out of many places that the people were coming from. One nation, like having to reimagine how to be one society and one group of people out of the fact that they came from many different places. So, you know, you've got all this diversity called to be one, but the very irony is that they had become separate in order to become one, separate from Britain to become one. It's a very powerful statement. And I want us to have that as the backdrop as we have these conversations. It's actually going to last over, you know, several conversations. We're going to look at the concept of one and many the concept of unity and diversity and how both of those are essential to the body of Christ. Mm. And it's going to be, I hope, a conversation where we bring all of who we are to this conversation because we represent both unity and diversity, you know, as we have this conversation along with all of our listeners, you know, that's really what the body is about. We're going to be focused in on just a chapter in the book of Ephesians, chapter four, mainly in some verses in there, where Paul is laying out the doctrine really of what we all need to agree on and yet what we all need to uniquely bring to the body of Christ. So let's go to the setting. What do we know about the book of Ephesians? And what do we know about the city of Ephesus to whom Paul was writing? It's a large city, Mm -hmm. like the mother city of Asia Minor, probably around 500,000 people, which is huge, big on land and sea, a trade city. What do we know about its religious 
composition. There were a lot of the magic arts that were practiced. In fact, when Paul was there, some of the people who were coming to Christ actually burned a lot of their magic spell books and things like that. And it was a real threat to some of the temples and the idol worshipers in, mm-hmm. that were proliferated throughout the town. Good. Acts talks about that, yeah. like right. 18, 19 or so chapters yeah. there, if you want to go check out some background there. Yeah, I think about just how pivotal of a city Ephesus was for the early church. And one of the things that was very unique about it was its diversity. There were a significant uh, group of Jewish people there. There were Gentiles. There were people from all over. It was kind of almost like this connection point between East and West. Yeah. And so it was really just a melting pot in a lot of ways of mm-hmm. a lot of yeah. different cultures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And trade coming in and out of the city right. was a big characteristic of the city. Good. And you mentioned Jews, you mentioned Gentiles, but also that some of the Greek worship, which you alluded to, Bill, you know, that they view themselves as the guardians of the temple of Artemis, which was Diana and her image. There, a lot of worship of that. So you've got, like you said, Russell, a melting pot, all kinds of people coming together. Okay, the purpose of the whole letter from Paul's perspective is to set out the mission of the church, its essence, its identity, its role in reconciling these diverse populations into one group, especially Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And the theme of the book, and you can just check it out and look at it like in verses 1 to 10 of chapter 2 and then on to verse uh, 22 in chapter 2, you're going to see both a vertical reconciliation of God restoring humankind to its original intent, you know, of being together, and then also a horizontal reconciliation of his people coming together. Whoa, that's the backdrop. Yeah, it's really interesting. This is one of Paul's prison letters, and another of Paul's prison letters, Colossians, we believe was written about the same time and was probably carried by the same person to be delivered. I always heard it expressed this way, Elisa. Ephesians, the primary theme is the church, the body of Christ, and Colossians, the primary theme is Christ, the head of the church. Yeah, and I think it definitely, it, you know, from a pastoral standpoint, I mean, it is one of the most significant books as it relates to the church and how to think about who we are and coming together from different backgrounds, but under one head and and being one body. Mm -hmm. And it really feels like the theme as well is how God is at work throughout the church, because even the way the book begins is all about the spiritual blessings that come from Christ, what the work is that God is doing in these people to bring them together. And so I have a feeling that as we go through this, we'll see that theme kind of play out as well. But it's very much, especially in chapter two, right, from death to life, this idea that God is working and pulling together and transforming people and a community at the same time. What you just said, Daniel, is like a... (sighs) You know, a yeah. sigh of relief, because when we come to the topic of one and many, of unity and diversity, most of us tense up a little bit in the mm-hmm. back of our neck and go, ah, how yeah. are we going to make that happen? And I think what you just said is key to all of our conversations. It is God who's going to do this work in mm-hmm. us and through us. Anybody here struggle with diversity and unity? You know, I mean, that's, you know, our, our whole world struggles yeah. with it. Our churches, our country, our states, our counties, our schools, our, and then our families. As we have these conversations, the first five conversations are going to be about this theme of unity, of one. And then we're going to turn the coin over, if you will, and look at the other side of it, of diversity or many. But let's start out, and we're going to just read the first couple of verses of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Russell, would you read it for us? I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He's just leading us into it. What's the first thing you notice in verse 1? As a prisoner. Okay. Paul is writing as a prisoner of the Lord. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Not Lord. of Rome. Not of Rome. Of the Lord. So he sees himself as belonging first and foremost completely to God. And that's what he sets out as his example. That's powerful. And then what he talks about is he's calling us to live in unity. The first thing he charges the Ephesians to do is to live what? Worthy in the manner in which you've been called. And that strikes me because the exhortation, the command suggests that it's possible to not. (laughs) Mm -hmm. that there can be a gap between Mm -hmm. the calling and how you live your life. But the encouraging thing is that the command also hints that it's possible to. 
True. Mm-hmm. Right. It's possible not to, but it's also possible to. Right. I think we're helped by understanding that worthy, that word has a, a concept of weightiness in it. I almost picture scales. And so put calling on one side of the scale and then living on the other side of the scale. And it's like Paul is saying, live in an equal way where your calling and the way you're living are in balance. It's consistent. And that makes sense to me. Then he goes on and he says, do it in terms of the hope to which you are called. And I thought, what does that mean? And I went back and looked at chapter one, verses 18 to 19. Paul writes at the beginning of this letter, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people. And he goes on in his incomparable power. What he's really talking about is living a life like Jesus lived. We talk about that all the time. But if we're going to be one, if we're going to be in unity, we're going to be consistent to who Jesus is and how we act in our conduct, right? I think that word worthy is really important to sit on for a minute because oftentimes when we read this verse, I think there's like a pressure to earn it, right? Like lead a life worthy, like be worthy Mm -hmm. of the calling to which you have been called. But if it's true that the context we've talked about is is God working in us and through us, then even the word calling, right, is an invitation. God inviting us up, right, Mm. to follow him. And so even in that, there's like a release of pressure as well. It's not work so hard to be worthy of the calling. It's more follow this invitation to follow God into this hope that he's offering. Yeah, I think the word worthy I think you're right. It's good to sit with that for a minute because in our context, most of the time when we hear the word worthy, it's being related to Jesus. Worthy is the lamb. It's pronounced mm-hmm. over yeah. him. Mm-hmm. And and we hear, okay, you be worthy. And it's kind of like, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can't be him. Like you say, Elisa, I can grow to be more like him, but I can't be worthy in the way that the lamb is worthy. And so the release of that pressure, I think, can come when we recognize that anything in our lives that in any way accurately reflects Jesus is because of the work of the Spirit in us. It's not because we're grinding our teeth and we've got our fists clenched and we're just slugging it out as hard as we can. No, it's the work of the Spirit in us that makes us like Him. Yeah, in fact, if I just look back, you know, there's that therefore in the beginning. So we're kind of catching Paul in the middle of a thought process. And the verse is right before. He says, now to him who's able to Mm. do far more abundantly than all we ask or Mm -hmm. think. Right according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church i therefore urge you to walk worthy so the ability to live that out comes from the power of god within us not from ourselves and let's also remember his words in chapter two it's grace that saves you it's a gift you know Mm -hmm. lest any of us boast and and this is where we would return to that deep exhale that i said yeah daniel we want to hold on to that you know this is kind of something I want us to do is one right here. Let's just take a deep exhale and know it's not all up to us. This is a gift and a calling that we can embrace and then live a life worthy simply by receiving it. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah, that feels good. A good start to our conversations called One and Many exploring how Ephesians chapter 4 can help us understand the need to commit to e pluribus unum as our perspective of the church. Out of many, one describes the need for unity, even in our diversity in the body of Christ. But diversity can also be divisive, and so that is an important tension that we'll be addressing, because you simply can't read the New Testament and not notice that emphasis on unity and keeping the unity. And so turn with the group to Ephesians chapter 4 for part 2 of this study called One and Many. I want to ask you to think about a time when you experienced a really unique and probably special kind of unity. Mm -hmm. Maybe as a team, maybe as a family, I don't know, maybe as a clique. I don't know what Mm -hmm. it might have been, but can you think of it and describe it for us? 
Yes. For better or for worse, I am from Philadelphia. <laughs> and 2018, when the Eagles won the Super Bowl, uh, went from New York back down, make my pilgrimage home. <laughs> and I remember the subways were free to get to the parade. And it was so full. You actually went. People were breaking out in the fight song. And just random strangers just hugging me, like yeah. just <laughs> like just you know what I mean, yeah. just so happy. And didn't matter where people were from or anything. It was just like a type of joy I had not seen mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What else? What other kind of a situation have you felt unity in? I think of a experience in college where there was a semester long leadership program that I was a part of. Everybody was away from their home mm. in this space and so it was shared space shared mission shared training and all that yeah. so it was a really unique experience yeah. in that way so that's, there was like a, cool. a deep sense of community of relationship of, purpose of unity purpose mm-hmm. all that together mm-hmm. yeah i would say not as much as should be but quite often i sense that kind of oneness with marlene my wife i don't think it's humanly possible to maintain that all the time, but I think we're very like-minded. We become very Mm like-minded about things, and uh, we talk all the time, and we do problem-solving together and all that kind of stuff, and I think there's that bond there that's supposed to be there, to use your phrase, Russell, for better or worse, Mm -hmm. you know, it's supposed to be there. I think I've experienced that Mm -hmm. with her. Mm -hmm. So it can be a whole bunch of people from all kinds of places like Mm -hmm. Russell, you shared, and or it can be a group called for a purpose or it could be marriage. Those are great illustrations. And and I was thinking about when my mom died, my older sister and younger brother and I gathering around her Mm -hmm. bed were very different. But we shared something in common, our mother and her relationship with each of us was different. And yet we all came together in that moment. So, you know, if we think about it, we have these moments when we come together and experience a oneness. We want to go back and look at this, where we are in the book of Ephesians. And Paul is writing towards this call of oneness, of unity. And just remind us here as we dive back in, why was oneness so important? Because Ephesus was one of the most diverse communities in the ancient world. I mean, through it being a trade center and a religious community, people from all over the world came to Ephesus, and it was, it was a big deal. And the timing of Paul writing this letter is to establish mm-hmm. the church. And so he wants to pull them together because they were so diverse, as you said, Bill. He wants to pull them together into what the purpose, the mission of the church would be. Can I push it even further? Immediately what came to mind when you said, why is oneness so important? I think of Jesus with his disciples praying for them and for the church moving forward, that they may be one as you, God, the Father, and I are one. And so that idea of oneness, Jesus very much was like, this is going to be a primary characteristic Mm -hmm. of what I want the people who follow me to be. like he knew. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) This this is going to be a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, you know, Paul writes about being one. We're going to look at several of his instructions as to how they were supposed to be one and how we then are supposed to be one. And the first one he says is in Ephesians 4, 1 to 3, he talks about keeping the unity. I want to back up a little bit and read some verses that come just before that. Let's look at Ephesians 2, verses 14 to 22, and just go around and read those. Keep the unity. Keep the unity. Let that echo in the back of your mind as you read these verses. And what do you hear when you read them? And Bill, would you start us? Verse 14 of chapter 2. For he, Jesus himself, is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord, and in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Wow. Do you hear that? One people, 
one body, Mm -hmm. one group of citizens, one family, one temple. Remember where this is being written, to the city of Ephesus, their religious practice was to protect the temple of Diana. Paul is laying this, and if you look at the book of Acts in uh, chapters 18, 19, around in there, you're going to see how rampant that worship (laughs) was there. And Paul is laying this directive to keep the unity right on their context of their culture, in a way that they would truly understand it. I noticed in that first verse that Bill read that it says, destroy the barrier and the dividing wall of hostility. What's Paul talking about there? Well, the two groups, making the two groups one are Jew and Gentile. And so there was a barrier between Jew and Gentile, both ethnically, religiously, culturally, I mean, in almost every way. And that barrier created hostility. And in Christ that barrier goes away because in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile. We're one in Christ. We talked about in our last conversation about the the vertical reconciliation between Mm -hmm. humankind and God and the the horizontal reconciliation of different kinds, tribes of Christians, so to speak. Anybody here ever see any struggle with Christians like this today (laughs) (laughs) where we might not get along so well horizontally? We're okay vertically. Well, especially because the immediate context is about circumcision, which was one of the most hotly debated theological ideas of the time. And if there's one thing that we continue to struggle with today, it's letting some hot theological ideas Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. get in the way of our love for one another and being one. And we're going to see Paul talk about the, quote, hot theological ideas that are non-negotiable in the next conversations. There are some things that we need to hold on to tightly, but there are other things that we need to take on in our character, in our our mind, in our hearts, in our spirits, in order to keep that unity. And this is what he's focusing on, keep the unity. And in verses one through three of chapter four, he fleshes out how we're supposed to do that. Bill, could you just read those three verses for us? I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Humble and gentle. This is really a lowly attitude. But in Greek society, it would be a ruination kind of a thing. You don't take on a humble attitude. This is counterintuitive. It'd be like becoming humiliated to the point of becoming a slave, which is interesting when Paul starts off this, he says, as a prisoner of the Lord. So he's already making it really clear that he takes that humble position Mm -hmm. himself. But if you think about it, this is not weakness, it's a meekness. And what Paul is really saying is that you need to take on this attitude of being like Jesus. He became a slave. I'm his slave. And now y'all become Mm -hmm. God's slave. I think it's also really interesting, Elisa, you've kept using the phrase, keep the unity, keep the unity. And I think that's really the essence of it in verse three. It's not our unity, it's the unity of the Spirit which seems to say to me at least that it's the Holy Spirit who produces the unity. We determine whether we're going to maintain it or disrupt it. We can disrupt the unity by not having the kind of attitudes that he calls for here. Exactly. But the Holy Spirit himself is one who actually produces the unity. And that goes back to what we chatted about a little while ago, and let's take a deep exhale. It's not all up to us. You know, we hear these commands, keep the unity, you know, make every effort, which is another phrase Paul uses, which really has a deep sense of urgency to it. It's like, get at it. But the other reality is he is crediting the power to do so to the Holy Spirit, and we can deeply excel and let him do that. And I think about the practical differences that would have existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. Let's just even look at in terms of their relationship to Rome. You know, you have Jews who are oftentimes marginalized by Roman society, even mocked because of their beliefs or and just even politically persecuted. And then many of those Gentiles would have been Romans who would have benefited from being a part of this society. And so there's just these immediate tensions there. And it strikes me that Paul's admonition to them doesn't lead with who's right and who's wrong or some particular type of position on theology. He says gentleness, humility, patience, bearing with one another Mm. in love. And so there's these aspects where the bearing with one another 
presumes a tension that is going to exist between that way that the groups see things and that the only way to be out of that in terms of the unity of the spirit is to actually not leave one another, not run away from one another, not accuse one another, not see who is right from one another, but to bear Mm. with one another. Which has the idea of serving. And that's, again, so counterintuitive. I remember one year in in leadership, our leadership team was really trying to figure out a way to unify our team, our overall team. And we came up with the idea of having a car wash where the leaders washed the other staff's Mm. cars. And we had to run out and wash the cars and then drive them around the building. And then and we did that over and over and over and over. My face was like bright red from running all those places. But at the end of the day, all of us came together and had a great sense of camaraderie, unity, reminding of purpose because of service. And I think that is some of what Paul is meaning here. Unity can come when we serve one another, when we're humble, when we sit low and embrace each other's needs. Yeah, that's a challenge we all need to hear, especially in today's divisive world where there are so many forces trying to pull us apart. Well, thanks for being part of the Discover the Word group. You've just heard the second part of our conversation in which we're exploring what it looks like when believers from diverse backgrounds come together as the united body of Christ, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And so actually the next couple of segments of the podcast are going to be brought to you by the number one. Sound like the educational kids show Sesame Street? Did you or your kids ever watch that show? They often said that they were sponsored by a number or a letter of the alphabet. And so I think it's going to be obvious why we say that this next part of our study, One and Many, is brought to you by the number one. And we'll get to that after a quick time out. At Discover the Word, we are constantly on the lookout for resources to help you grow in your faith. And we often tell you about them on our social media outlets. In addition to engaging you in the studies that we do each week and keeping you up to date on all things Discover the Word, we use social media to point you to other Our Daily Bread Ministries resources that can help you grow in your walk with Christ. Some of those are accessible through our website at discovertheword.org. And so I would encourage you to bookmark that site. And then also, when you're online, look for the links at the bottom of the page to connect with us on social media. That way you'll get the latest updates on Facebook and Twitter or Instagram. And those are key ways to keep informed on what's happening at Discover the Word. And now back to One and Many, brought to you by the number one. In our last conversation, we were talking a lot about keeping the unity, and we kind of touched on this, but it's something that I'm still thinking about, and I just wanted to throw it out. I noticed that in chapter 214, it started with Jesus is our peace, Mm -hmm. but then 4-3 ended with maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about how Jesus empowers and invites us into this unity. And there's almost this sense in which we have to be at peace in order to be the kind of people who can be humble and gentle and patient and bear with one another. But even more than that, I think the word that jumped out to me was bond, right? There's like this strength to that word. I don't know how that strikes you all, but this bond of peace that regardless of what we're running into, we have this bond. Elise has several times used the vertical reconciliation and horizontal reconciliation. And you put those ideas together and it forms a cross. And the horizontal member of the cross doesn't have anything to hang on if the vertical member is not in place. So Mm. he is our peace. Mm -hmm. That's the vertical relationship. Mm -hmm. And without peace with him, we really lack the capacity to have real lasting peace with each other. And have you ever noticed how at those times when we're busiest or on edge ourselves, how hard it is to be gentle huh? and kind to others? <laughs> what right? do you mean, Dan? I don't, yeah, I can't really <laughs> no, say that. No. I'm unfamiliar with but that. But in those moments where we have this deep sense of God's peace, mm. it almost opens the door mm. to being humble or gentle or patient or kind. It does. It's like what we were talking about moments when we've experienced a unique oneness, whether it's with a sports team winning or a mm-hmm. family death. Or It's when you come together, you're reminded 
of what you hold in common. That's what you're saying, Bill. You know, the vertical beam of the cross gives us our purpose for coming together. But you're right, Daniel. The bond of peace is Jesus. And I also think about, and this is in English, so I don't want to take this too far, but he called himself a bond servant, you know, a slave of Christ, you know, and the bond of peace. There is a concept of being tied to each other. And we're tied to his peace. The bond of peace is what actually holds society together. You know, when we have peace, we move ahead as a nation or as a society or as a culture or as our world, you know, looking at at whatever's going on around us. So that's really helpful. And that's what we are talking about. And as we continue looking at how we're going to be one, keeping the unity is part of it, living a life worthy is part of it. And and now in this conversation, we want to talk about this very interesting language that Paul uses. And he goes and talks about being one in body, spirit, and hope. And we're mm-hmm. going to look in the next conversations of other elements of this oneness. But what's interesting to me is that in these next breakdowns, we're going to actually see Paul alluding to the three persons of the Trinity hmm. and what each one of them provides or represents in terms of our being one as hmm, they are one. Now, the Trinity is a complex concept. You think? Yeah, yeah. tiny <laughs> bit, <laughs> tiny bit. But it's three persons of God in one person. Okay. Anybody ever struggle with that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's a certain amount of mystery in that because we are physical, tangible beings that live in a physical, tangible world. So one is one. We see one. We can't appropriate how three and one can be the same. It doesn't work for us because we live in a physical realm, whereas God dwells in a spiritual realm. And I think that that might be one of the great discoveries that we get to have when we finally are in the Lord's presence is to get a little bit of understanding of how Mm -hmm. that Trinity works. How that relationship works. But then God complicated it even more by joining the physical realm in the person of Christ. Yeah. And we have these pictures that we glimpse of Christ later where he still has this physical body in Revelation or in other places. So he's like embodying the physical realm as well as the spiritual realm, Mm -hmm. three yet Mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And pretty much any time we try to like define it, we end up in places that the church throughout history has been like, oh yeah, you're going too far that way or too far that way. (laughs) And somehow though, it makes sense to me that it doesn't completely make sense (laughs) to me. There's something about if I can fully wrap my head around who God is, the reality that if I am referencing and the revelation of a supreme being who is outside of time, what does that Mm -hmm. even look like and mean? That I ought to grapple with the details of how that all works. And yet at the same time, he's given us enough clarity and perspective Mm -hmm. to approach him with a sense of understanding that actually reflects back to us how we ought to live. Mm. And, I, and that's enough for me. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. and, well, and that's why theologians have often referred to God as the divine other, mm-hmm. because whatever you imagine him to be, eventually he's other than that, <laughs> because we can't totally fathom him. You're right. If we could totally fathom him, he wouldn't be the God that we actually need or the God that he actually is. So I've alluded to the fact that Paul's going to give this series of one statements here, and we're going to look at just the first one of them here. Daniel, would you read verse 4? This is Ephesians 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. Okay, and he's going to go on through verse 6 with some more ones, but we're going to cover those next. So this first group of ones, actually Paul makes seven statements of oneness in these verses here. So we thought three in one yeah. stuff, now it's seven in <laughs> Now it's seven. And <laughs> some historians, commentators have thought that this was coming from a creedal statement. Hmm. Um, interesting. But what's really kind of surprising and not our norm is that he starts off with the Trinity. We're used to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But Paul starts off with the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Huh? Now, why would the Spirit be so important to establishing unity. And remember, who are the Ephesians? What kinds of divisions were they having? Yeah, almost every kind imaginable, (laughs) actually. I've heard it said over the years that even though all three persons of the Trinity are always active in carrying out God's will, in the Old Testament, God the Father was the primary person of the Trinity at work on the earth. 
during the Gospels, obviously, Jesus, but after Pentecost, it's been the Holy Spirit. So perhaps maybe the reason the Holy Spirit comes first is because he is the one who's most intimately engaged with us now. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will yeah. provide one yeah. who will go with you. And in a lot of ways, you know, my little grandson's always going, but why can't we see Jesus? You know, yeah, right. But you can, you can sense the Spirit. Yeah. I mean, we really can, can't yeah. we? I've even heard the Spirit described as the personal presence of God with us. And, you know, it's interesting when you think about Jesus, because Jesus actually said it's better for him to leave so that the Spirit could come. And I wonder if part of that is because of what we're talking about in these conversations that, yeah, because in order to bear fruit of unity, of humility, of gentleness, of peace, of all those things we've talked about, we need that personal presence of God at work in us Mm -hmm. if we have any hope or chance of living this out. Yeah. Yeah, the Holy Spirit, in a sense, becomes ultimate common ground for us, Mm -hmm. like the Philadelphia celebration or the mom who's passing away. We need that common basis and the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us, no matter how different we all are, he's the same. Mm. And that common ground gives us basis to have unity built on. Bill, you mentioned that we've tried to physically express the Godhead. You know, Mm. uh, it's really tough. And none of our illustrations truly work. But like some of us think about water, you know, as liquid and frozen (laughs) and gas, or we think about an egg. So there's the yolk and the white and the shell. You know, so we try (laughs) to concretize the Godhead, the Trinity. And... All of those are incomplete, but they give us a sense of how there can be three in one. I like the illustration my pastor, Robert Gelinas, uses. It's a a concrete illustration as well, but it's built on relationship. And he uses the illustration, you've probably seen it, of the circle of friends. And what it is is a, a clay sculpture with human bodies in a circle, holding hands and looking all of them towards the center. And his suggestion was, this is how the Godhead relates. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit looking at each other, connecting with each other, conversing with Mm -hmm. each other, always together in relationship. And I think almost of, and, and this is an emotional thing, this is not a scriptural thing, but I almost imagine that the circle opening and the hands extending to you and to me and welcoming us to take that hand and come Mm. into that most intimate circle and commune. And then offering that hand to our sister, to our brother, to the one in our body and the one outside our body and the larger body of Christ, to the one who's still coming to the body of Christ. Is that what that relationship that the Spirit enables, he is the one who enables us to move towards unity in? And I would say too, God is love. And so in order for God to be love, there has to be like this give and take of love. And so I think one of the beautiful pictures of the Trinity is the fact that God was able to be love, to have that as a characteristic before anybody else was created that God would show love to. Mm -hmm. And then the very story of the Bible is this God who is love, who's showing love, Father, Son, and Spirit to one another, creates the world. Mm -hmm. And the very first picture we have of when everything was right in the world was God's love relationship with his creation Mm -hmm. and with us. And then how quickly things fell apart after that. But the whole story of the Bible is moving forward to when exactly what you described, there is that picture of love that we see where it's not just God, Father, Son, and Spirit loving each other, but it is this much bigger picture of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who are a part of this love relationship with God. Yeah, and I do think back, and you you referenced this earlier, Jesus, toward the end of his earthly ministry, when he's praying and he's talking to the disciples, giving them a sense of encouragement of how they can move on with the fact that he's leaving. And he says, I am going to leave you with a comforter. So even as I pray for the sense of unity and that they would be one. I'm giving you the access and the to the one who can make you unified. And so I think that's part of the reason why Paul starts with the spirit because he's, you know, echoing the same insight of Jesus that the only way 
for us to across our differences and across our you know various points of reference and perspectives and sin to come together is through the power through the comfort through the wisdom through the self-sacrificing humility of the spirit within us focus is on unity as we explore what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4 about the reasons we have to make unity in the body of Christ a priority. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. It's hard to miss the emphasis on one, isn't it? And that's why this part of this Discover the Word conversation is brought to you by the number one. Well, as the conversation continues, uh, they're going to pick up uh, one of those phrases about oneness, one baptism. And Elisa has an intriguing question, and she has a hunch that the answers may be a little surprising. Have you been baptized? Maybe how many times? Maybe how many ways? Just wondering. (laughs) I've been baptized four times. (laughs) See, I just knew it. Twice by sprinkling, twice by immersion. Okay. Daniel? Uh, just twice. I've just, been, I was dunked. Just twice. Dunked both times. Mm-hmm. Twice as a baby in the Catholic Church, mm-hmm. and then as a 17-year-old and when I made a professional of faith okay. and immersion. Mm-hmm. Okay. And me, mm-hmm. three. So as a kid before I knew God, and then sprinkled, and then... Dunked. Eleven baptisms at this table, <laughs> but only four people. <laughs> I think that's crazy. Why do you think we may have repeated the ritual? Now you can tell your stories. Yeah, I'd love to hear them. For me, I was first baptized by getting dunked at like five or six or seven, something mm-hmm. like that, after a profession of faith. Mm-hmm. And then it was funny in high school, I think it was after a church camp or something like that, I felt like I really became a Christian. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes we talk about which one stuck. <laughs> and uh, I don't think it's maybe that easy to answer that sometimes. But I got dunked again. And then it really gets interesting because then over time, I slowly ended up becoming a part of the Anglican Church. And I'm a pastor in the Anglican Church. And we practice infant baptism with great sincerity and joy. Hmm. And my journey was kind of the opposite because I grew up in a Presbyterian church. So I was sprinkled mm-hmm. as an infant and then again at confirmation. And then I went on to join a Baptist church and baptism was required for membership. And then after I came to Christ, I was baptized by immersion again because I was in a Baptist church at that point. And I think um, one of the challenging things is that Mm -hmm. we take things like this and make them points of division instead of our common commitment to Christ being the yeah. point of togetherness and unity. Yeah. And I think that's where it becomes challenging for us. Yeah. Yeah, for me, uh, I didn't even know about the first one because we weren't yeah. a very practicing family or anything like infant, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it had like no connection with my life in terms of just other than the fact that my mom happened to mention it once. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the second one was really a definitive formational moment for me. I still remember the date, August 20th, 1995. Whoa. That was, I remember sitting there. I remember the folks singing the gospel songs and, and you know, me wearing all white. And mm. it was this picture that I had of me giving the keys of my life to Jesus that I remember sitting there. And it was mm. very significant. That's, that's awesome. Beautiful. Yeah, that's awesome. Mine were degrees of understanding of what it meant as well, or <laughs> accepted practices, which were yeah. part of denominations. And yet I find it so confusing that here we are, as Daniel said, 11 baptism at a table of four people. (laughs) And then Paul, writing to the Ephesians, is talking about unity. And one of the trio of statements he makes is about one baptism. So I just want to ground this conversation in what we're talking about. You know, we're talking about one and many. And in these first five conversations, we're talking about one, the unity that we have in Christ and that God calls us to. And it's a unity that he provides. And we've been really relieved (laughs) to Mm -hmm. understand that and grapple with it. It's not all up to us, except we need to lean into it. And then we'll look at the many element and other conversations coming up. But Paul is highlighting the role of the Lord slash Jesus in keeping the unity. And let's just read verse five, Daniel. Would you grab that and pull Mm -hmm. that out for us? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One Lord. Paul is very fond of that descriptor. 
for Jesus. There's 20 references to Lord in just this letter. It's amazing. Yeah, well, I think the idea, right, of what a Lord is in that time is a picture of someone who's in charge of an area or a group of people, and they're responsible for them. And they're supposed to be responsible for their well-being. But oftentimes, the pictures of Lords we see throughout history, lowercase l, Lords, Mm -hmm are people that usually abuse their power to build Lord themselves up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wonder if maybe part of what Paul's doing, especially as he's in the midst of a culture that is very much about power lording it over others, mm-hmm. is he's trying to hint at the mm-hmm. fact that actually there's another Lord mm-hmm. who is working for the well-being and the good of the world. Actually, yeah. maybe <laughs> not another Lord, but one actual Lord. One actual the Lord. Lord. Yeah, the yeah, one Lord, yeah. Uh, I think that's really good, Daniel. And I think that when we think about our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Greek word kurios, translated Lord, it could mean something as simple as sir. Hmm. It could be just showing somebody respect. Or it can be a position of great authority like you're talking about, Daniel. So it was a very versatile kind of agile word that Paul theologizes Mm -hmm. in the person of Jesus and gives it higher meaning and higher value. Mm -hmm. And his emphasis is that there is one Lord. There's not a separate Lord for the Gentile Christians and a separate Lord for the Jewish Christians. There's one Lord. So in this trio of ones, he's really talking about the person of Jesus and the Godhead. And then he talks about one faith. You know, there's one Lord, one faith. What do you think that means, one faith? Yeah, well, we often think of faith as like coming to a mental understanding of something. Mm -hmm. But I think in this context, what he's probably pointing to is a shared belief. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he talks at one place about the faith once delivered. The faith is this kind of body of truth that represents what we believe about God. Yeah, yeah. if anybody's had, had a statement of faith of, mm-hmm. for yourself yeah. that you've signed or for an organization you serve with or for a church you belong to, it's a kind of a, a condensation of the common basic tenets. Now, mm-hmm. different bodies will add in different things. And you know, I can remember many times uh, in working in interdenominational situations, trying to differentiate between beliefs that were essential to salvation and beliefs that were Mm non-essential to salvation. So in other Mm -hmm. words, these essentials is that, you know, we believe in Jesus Christ as the son of God. You know, you have this whole list and sometimes it's a creed you recite. Yeah. I remember coming on staff with crew and Alan Scholes was the teacher and he kind of talked about these three buckets. One was opinions, Mm -hmm. right? Like what kind of sandals Jesus wore, for instance, (laughs) you can speculate. The other were persuasions that were doctrinal positions that might be things important enough to decide on what church to go to or something uh, like we talked about baptism and one's understanding of that. But then he said then there's convictions and the conviction level is like these are what we believe is the core to the faith, essential to the faith. It's a good way to put it. And I think part of the maturity of Paul saying one faith, for us to have unity, we have to be able to know the difference. And one, oftentimes we get into trouble Mm -hmm. with trying to get unity when everyone tries to make the persuasions and opinions convictions. convictions. That's That's right. right. And so I think it's really helpful that Paul says one faith and kind of alludes to these core essentials. That's super. And and then he he goes to one baptism. And we are actually talking about how conviction can become a part of baptism. That's why we've been baptized so many times here around our table. But I think it's interesting that we're told in Acts chapter 19 of a scenario where somebody had to be Mm rebaptized as well. I've always understood and heard the one baptism is a reference to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Mm -hmm. Spirit at salvation baptizes us into the body of Christ and that that's the one baptism. Well, thank you for pointing that out because when we're going to look at the Acts passage, that is one of the distinctions that's made. And so let's read a little bit of that to contextualize it. Apollos was at Corinth. Paul took the road traveling and he comes upon some disciples. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked in verse three, what baptism did you receive? And he said, John's baptism. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Mm -hmm. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, 
Daniel, read verse 6 and 7, if you would. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. Okay. It goes back to exactly what you're, you're saying, Bill. Maybe Paul is calling us in this section of the ones that he's calling out towards the one baptism, which really underlines and lifts up our dependency on the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because it's one of those ideas. I mean, even the way that we started talking about different baptisms, it's almost an uncomfortable thing to talk about sometimes in Christianity because of how Mm -hmm. divisive churches Mm -hmm. can be on what is the right version of baptism. Mm -hmm. And so when you put it in that context of one body, one spirit, one hope, and then one Lord, one faith, one baptism, we're getting this picture of elevating the conversation to a different place. Mm -hmm right? Mm -hmm. That this is about uh, being one body. Mm -hmm. This is about this one spirit that binds Mm -hmm. us all together. This one hope, Mm -hmm. this one faith, Mm -hmm. this one baptism by Mm -hmm. this one Lord. Yeah. And I, and that's where it's so helpful to know that the key word baptizo, where we get baptism from really means to be immersed in something, Mm -hmm. right? To Mm -hmm. immersion in general. And Mm -hmm. so Sometimes we use it as shorthand when we say baptism, when it's really we're talking about water baptism, but it borrows or it gets the strength of its own symbolism from the concept of being immersed in the spirit. And so if Paul is leaning us to say, hey, we, we want to talk about this oneness, that oneness is only possible when we're immersed in the same spirit. Even if he's focused on the spirit in the first verse that we looked at, and now he's focused on Jesus. And we're going to see in our next conversation, God, you can't separate the three. They are interdependent and they will express who they are as we look at each of them. A helpful conversation and a great reminder about what we all have in common, our shared commitment to Jesus Christ. Well, in this first half of our study of Ephesians chapter four called One and Many, We've been focusing on the one unity part of this. And so they're going to wrap up part one by talking about something Christians believe that most religions throughout history have not. And that is the monotheistic idea of one God. That is a unifying belief that all Christians have. But even though that is a core belief for us, does that always translate into the way we live? Well, a challenging conversation about one God closes part one of this Discover the Word study about one and many. If you're sharing your faith with a people group in an undeveloped nation, what kinds of obstacles might you expect? One is we have a very, I think, clear definition of sin. Mm which is we have a sin problem between us and God. And other cultures define sin very differently. I have a missionary friend who served with some tribal groups in the upper Amazon. And when he started talking to them about sin, and he started talking about morality and moral sin and immorality and things like that, that was so far off their radar. It was unbelievable. They said, no, that's not sin. Selfishness is sin. Ah. Gossiping is sin. And he was going for the ones that we would consider the big sins, you Mm. know, but to them, it was more the attitudinal things that they saw as the big problem. Hmm. Okay. So they define sin mm. differently. So definition of our theological terms. Yeah. Okay. What other kinds of obstacles? I need to be honest. Mm -hmm. Even just the language of sharing my faith in an (laughs) underdeveloped place, (laughs) I'm uncomfortable with that because I'm thinking like, who am I to define what's underdeveloped or whatever to start? And just how much abuse has been done throughout the history of the church with like, I'm taking my faith to this people group and they're going to receive it along with all the imperialism and colonialism that I'm bringing with me and... I'm struggling with this, but at the same time, with the awareness that like my uncle flew for jungle aviation radio service that worked with Wycliffe, and one of the beautiful things that happened as a result of those missionary pilots going into different areas is some of these languages were written down for the first time, and culture was preserved in those places as a result, and stuff like that. So there's really good ways to do it, Mm -hmm. which that would be some of the obstacles, right? Language, learning language and things like that. But there's also been so much abuse that it's hard to even talk about this, I think. (laughs) Well, I just would want to say as kind of a qualifier that I understand exactly what you're saying and the imperialism and Mm -hmm. colonialism and Mm -hmm. all that 
has done great damage to people and to the gospel. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't want people to go away with the impression that we think every missionary has those kind of tangible things in their thinking as they go. I think just the desire to share Jesus with people Mm -hmm. who've never heard of him is a noble thing. And to try and keep it in that pristine place is a challenge. Yeah. And I see that in my uncle. Yeah. Yeah. And appreciate it. You know, that observation and like what makes development better? necessarily like sometimes when i'm bogged down and feeling like i'm chained to my devices and (laughs) you know uh, modern sensibilities i'm like man a more simple life is something that but that perspective of simultaneously holding the tension of i'm coming to bring a message that is life-changing but i also am coming to experience being formed by an element or an insight or a cultural perspective that I also need Mm -hmm. and try to hold those together so that there's a a conversation and not just a monologue. So I think that's one of the things I think about. The reality is when we want to share our faith, when we want to introduce people to the God that has made all the difference in our lives, there are going to be generational obstacles. There are going to be diversity obstacles. There are going to be belief obstacles, on and on and on. But the reality is that one of the ones that Paul especially experienced in Ephesus is the idea of having one God Mm -hmm. was radical Mm -hmm. because the more normal religion was multiple gods, multiple gods. And, you know, if we really look at the idea of the Shema, you know, the one God that goes throughout scripture is very countercultural. Oh, yeah. And the people in the Bible All of these heroes that we often look at were the very people that struggled to get their minds around the idea of one God because their cultural context throughout the whole history of the Bible is multiple gods. Well, and really the whole history of the world. I mean, we're talking about multiple gods, polytheism, like it was an ancient thing. But Mm -hmm. there are parts of the world today where people worship multiple gods or they're aware of other gods other than the god of their own community or village or whatever it might be. And I think it's much more of a present day problem than maybe we acknowledge. Yeah, I I would say that if just looking at the idols of materialism, of individualism, (laughs) Mm -hmm. of... Westernism. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's uh, at least about maybe 300 million gods Mm -hmm. that are worshipped in in our country. And in one sense, the concept of serving one god is unique, or it's common, but in another, it's very uncommon common yeah. mm-hmm. even today and this whole conversation you know where you're starting off with different theological terms bill and then you're moving on to this whole idea of imperialism and you know all of those reveal the inner heart of our humankind you mm-hmm. know all of us yeah. are gross <laughs> everybody has sinned and fallen short and that's what makes understanding one god something we all need to pay attention to mm-hmm. paul is writing to the church at ephesus about being one and we'll look in a little while about being many And how the one and many really need to go together in order to express the character of God and to accomplish his design for the body of Christ. They need to go together. But as we're summing up our conversation about being one, let's review a little bit. What have we said? We've said that we're to live a life worthy, which is consistent in our behavior with who Jesus is. And we're to keep the unity, which is really something that God does through us Mm -hmm. as we depend on him. And then Paul has this seven statements of oneness. And we've talked about how that represents the three persons of the Godhead. He starts off with being one in spirit and then one Lord. And now today we're looking at Ephesians 4, verse 6. Bill, would you read that for us? And just Mm -hmm. glancing at it, it's got the one and the many packed into this one verse. Yeah, That's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So you have <laughs> the one God and one Father over the many. And, and the probably all. that all goes with the other. So just to kind of give us context here, let's go ahead and read verses four through six and hear that summation, Bill, because okay. it's like a climax we've come to, isn't it? There is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Give us some information as to why Paul would uniquely talk to the Ephesians about this one 
God. And here we're talking about God the Father now. So he's hit on the, the Spirit, he's hit on Jesus the Lord, and now it's on God the Father. Why do the Ephesians need to have this teaching? When I think of Paul evoking the Father, it immediately makes me think of a father has children. So there's a reshifting of identity that's happening to say, if we have the same father, then that means we're brothers and sisters. Different. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that identity matters more than any other previous identity that would have been reason for our division. It elevates this spiritual relationship. We mm-hmm. understand the significance of our earthly brothers and sisters, right? I mean, we really understand that. And when Paul's calling us to understand our relationship to our spiritual brothers and sisters, suddenly I look across the table at you and I go, oh, you know, I need to love you differently. But, you know, think about what was happening in Acts chapter 19. Yeah, see, that was where I was mm-hmm. thinking. And I really love what Rasul said, but my mind went mm-hmm. a different way. Yeah, go My with mind that. thought, he says, one God and Father, which is a masculine term, and they were the world yeah. center of worship of a goddess, mm. Diana mm-hmm. slash Artemis. Mm-hmm. And that would have been a really severe recalibration for the Ephesians to move away from the thinkings of a goddess to God and Father. And it really would be helpful Mm -hmm. to even go read Acts 19, because this is where there's a riot because of them talking about Jesus. And Demetrius is a silversmith who makes silver shrines of Artemis, Mm -hmm. this goddess. Mm -hmm. And as a result of people being converted to following Jesus, they're not buying as many silver shrines anymore (laughs) or worshiping them. And so as a result, there's a riot. The implications of the financial benefits of why people will cause you or encourage you toward idolatry Again, in mm-hmm. our context, materialism, yes. consumerism, mm-hmm. buy this and you'll experience your best life. Get this, go to this trip and you'll find true happiness. happiness. Contentment. That oftentimes there's this aspect of a certain sort of profit motive that hides behind this ideology of a greater good. And when mm-hmm. I see Demetrius mm-hmm. responding in that way, and then I go, man, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. True. <laughs> Paul is directing the Ephesians towards this oneness. There is one mm-hmm. God, right. one God. And, you know, if you want to keep the unity, if we want to be the character of God expressed physically on this planet in his body, the church, we're going to remember there is one God. And as you said, Rasul, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, this message is as much for us as it was for them. There's one We are to be one. We are to worship one. We are to belong to the one. We are to turn away from the others, recognize the one, give our lives to the one, serve the one. Jesus said you cannot serve both God and mammon, which is money or material wealth. But you could almost say you cannot serve God and fill in the blank Mm -hmm. with whatever is that thing that dominates your own personal thinking or my own personal thinking. And here's the gospel, the really good news. Who is that one God? A good and loving father who wants what's best for his kids. Mm, Great way to wrap up this first part of our series called One and Many. Obviously, we've been focusing on the one, a unity part of the equation as we've worked through Ephesians chapter four with emphasis on verses one through six. And so, Elisa, where do we go next? We're in this great conversation, one and many, and we've spent five different conversations on the one, you know, on how we build unity, who we are together, how we represent God consistently, and it's time to turn the page and look at the benefit of the many. We have been given different abilities, and that's the context of Ephesians as well. Remember that e pluribus unum. You know, what did we say that meant, Bill? Out of many, (laughs) one. Okay. And that was the slogan that could go on the body of Christ out of many, one, and then within one are still many. Yeah, and in part two, we will pick up at Ephesians chapter four and verse seven and see how Paul gives weight to the many diversity side of things. It also is an important part of how we think about the church and the body of Christ. And I hope to be at your spot at the table alongside Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. Well, Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, 
challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And Discover the Word is part of Our Daily Bread Ministries, where for the last 80 plus years, we've been telling the story of Jesus, thanks to the financial partnership of listeners and friends who share our mission, which is to make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world. And so if you'd like to give a one-time gift or give a recurring monthly gift as a Discover the Word partner, click on the Donate button on our website at discovertheword.org. You can give safely and securely right there. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministry.